G'day Internet. With the release of Crawdit version 3.4, I thought it was high time that I get around to recording a video, giving an introduction and or a tutorial, if you want to call it that, um, to Crawdit. In order to do that, I've set up a, a fresh account here and uh, we'll run through the steps from installation discuss some of the, the options and features uh, and go on to audit some code so you can see how I use Crawdit. The first step is to clone the code base. Uh, strongly recommend that you use the Git repo rather than uh, rely on a, a source code package that may be available for your distro. There's a lot more functionality in the Git repos than there are in those packages. Uh, it also allows you to stay updated uh, more frequently as I will stage changes in the Git repo that aren't in the packages. Once we've cloned brought it into, in this case, uh, just our home directory, we want to add that to the path so that we can run Grod it. Uh, we do that by adding it to, in my case, bash RSC. If you use a different shell, you'll have to use a, a different code stack, a, a different way of uh, modifying your path environment variable. Then we reload bash RC to make sure that the new path is available, and then we can run load it speed, and we can see that we have brought version 3.4 in our path. Now, Grodit has a few different command line options for run crawl at minus h uh, or crawl without any arguments and it'll spit out this uh, description for the command line options there are three main categories it's sort of the functional changes cosmetic changes and utility functions starting at the bottom uh, we have the utility functions so that's minus h prints this message minus V prints the number and minus L uh, lists available databases. We'll touch on minus L uh, when we get to the point of auditing some code. For the cosmetic changes, it doesn't change the, the functionality of Grodit itself, but it'll do things like uh, suppress the ASCII banner that prints Grodit. So if you're running a, a Grodit multiple times in a script, for example, uh, you might want to suppress that. Uh, it'll change the colors or remove the colors. Um, you can try the different things and see what you like. Um, and then the last, or I would argue possibly most important uh, set of functionality is, is the first group that changes the functionality. Um, minus D for the database to use. Um, is probably the most important. You want to make sure that you use the right database uh, for the language you're scanning or for the type of issue that you're looking for. Uh, the other important one is minus capital A. And I see a lot of the tutorials on the internet um, or people's screenshots that they run brought it with minus A. Um, I would say that's a bad idea. There are times when you do want to use minus A, uh, but for the most part, uh, as it says in the description here, it will cause Grodit to scan unwanted and difficult files. And so if you're auditing source code, you might not want to scan uh, PDFs and JPEGs and uh, zip files. So if you scan, if you run Grodit with minus A, it'll scan all the files. And there's a lot of files that are not helpful to doing a source code review and they're excluded by default. So when you do minus A, you remove that exclusion. So if you find that your results are noisy or it's maybe printing out binary data to the screen, um, that's probably because you're running it with minus A. In general, I would say I only run minus A if I'm trying to scan, say, firmware images, things that you know aren't source code necessarily, uh, and usually when I'm looking for secrets. Um, so 
I probably use this a handful of times a year and, and I run Grodin multiple times a day, typically. Uh, so it's a, it's a very low usage option. Um, the next one is minus X and depending on which grep you use, uh, I tend to go with GNU grep, I, I ordered on Linux. Uh, the way it gloves to do this file matching, sometimes you might have to exclude files by a, a, a full path name. Sometimes you can do wildcard. Uh, it's not always going to work uh, when you want it to, uh, but it's there to try to reduce noise from false positives in uh, things like compressed JavaScript files and map files and uh, database files. Minus I will cause all of the regular expressions to be case insensitive. Uh, I do try to make sure that the rules are right um, and shouldn't require any case insensitivity for scanning. But if you're writing your own rules, you may want to run this. Um, and if you're dealing with strings, for example, perhaps it's a, it's a good idea to do. Um, and then the last one in the functional, it changes the number of lines to print before and after, oh, sorry, the total amount of lines uh, to display. So it, it, the context is, or the default context is two. So print one line before, one line after for a total of two lines. And we can uh, take a quick look. So if we run broad it minus the PHP, just looking for some PHP code. And Grodic comes with a couple of files that are really just there for me to run uh, unit tests. We have a, a bunch of exec calls in here. And we can see that it prints out the banner and then it highlights uh, a lot of uh, lot of code. Um, and we can see in, also in terms of the, the context here that uh, because it has multiple consecutive lines matching, so line three, four, five, six, et cetera, all matches. Uh, the contextual lines before and after only occur at the start and the beginning of those. Uh, if this was a larger file uh, where there might be a lot more comments or other code in between each of these ones, um, if you increase the number of context lines, you will see more of the file printed around uh, the affected code. One of the other questions I get uh, around Grodit is, uh, it just prints some highlighted code. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. Um, and that's okay. If you're just starting out in code review, um, this is an opportunity to learn. Uh, you will generally have to do the research. So in this case, we know we're looking at PHP code. And we can see that line three here is an exec function. So I would then go to Google, uh, look at PHP exec vulnerabilities, PHP exec uh, security, and read up and then apply that knowledge back into this code. One of the other things is I tend to use Grodit when I hunt for vulnerabilities rather than for doing uh, full-fledged security reviews. So I'm usually more concerned with just finding individual vulnerabilities or individual bugs rather than sort of the, the holistic uh, approach of trying to find all the badness in a code base. One of the things that's new in version 3.4 is the ability to set default command line flags. Now, I would strongly recommend that you only use the cosmetic flags for this uh, because it does affect every invocation of Grodit, uh, even if it's called from a script. So if you were to run the scripts in the uh, miscellaneous directory in the Grodit repo, those scripts sometimes change the behavior of Grodit in order to do specifically what they need. And so if you add any other command line arguments to your default command line arguments, um, that can impact how effective those scripts are. In my case, um, I like a different color scheme than the default 
grab color scheme. Uh, and I also like to use bin to order the code. So I'm going to um, add the default command line arguments minus B, which is colorblind mode and minus capital L, which is bin lines uh, to my bash RC. And then we're going to uh, reload bash RC to get those environment variables and types, which we can validate. Make sure that they're actually set. And then if I run grot it with the same arguments that we did before, we can see that it's now different. The codes, uh, the, the colors are different. So we have more of a, a, a blue yellow uh, colorblind friendly um, scheme. And then also the the lines are vim lines. So if I wanted to explicitly jump to this line, I can copy that and I can, you'll see that the cursor is set exactly at the line uh, that it's set. Uh, so since I do a lot of code review on, on vim, that makes sense to me. Uh, so I'm gonna leave these in place uh, for the rest of the tutorial. So just bear that in mind that if, if you're running this and you don't like these command line options, you can skip this step uh, and your code will just look, or your output will look slightly different. The next thing to talk about is the databases. And broad minus L, that lists all of the databases that um, are uh, within within the directories that Grodit will look for. Um, and so we have the, the default set here. Uh, one of the other things is that by installing it into our home directory, uh, it also looks in the miscellaneous directory. And we see we have a couple of scripts there, AMP script, uh, if you're doing Salesforce uh, coding, uh, Flatline, QBase 64, uh, Suppression, WordPress, so there's a couple of extra rules there that you get from doing it this way, which isn't there if you install it through uh, a distro package. Now, if you read the readme file, you might think that the best way to approach something is to just run crawl minus the language and uh, get some output. That will certainly find a lot of, a lot of code to look at. Uh, I personally prefer to start much smaller uh, and audit for a smaller subset of vulnerabilities. Uh, ideally, I like to start by looking for things that have a very high probability of being a vulnerability and having uh, a high likelihood of being exploitable. So let's look at a project here. We're going to clone PHP IPAM. And then once we've Clone PHP IPAM, we will start to audit it. Uh, usually, my first choice of database is a database called Flatline, which lives in the miscellaneous directory. Uh, and it's a set of rules aimed at finding uh, what might be referred to as low hanging fruit, which is uh, high impact, highly likely exploitable vulnerabilities. Um, and the rules for PHP are quite good. I spent a lot of time auditing PHP and, and sort of refining these rules. Um, so that's usually my, my starting point. And it doesn't contain um, vulnerabilities that might be low impact, but easier to find, such as cross site script. Uh, and I'll feed this into more uh, so we can. And the items in yellow are the, the vulnerability candidates that it finds. Um, obviously, you'll want to do a bit more analysis. You won't just look at the output of this, but you, you'll use this as a basis uh, for auditing further. Uh, because, uh, you want to make sure that there are, aren't any uh, if conditions that stops exploitation or um, that the input is actually input, not you know static string, etc. Um, and so, if I look at this 
that unfortunately it's wrapped around. We have an include edit post type dot php. So that's um, a partially controlled file name. Uh, we could do a dot dot slash dot dot slash, but it still has to end in uh, PHP. So you could traverse, but you can only include a file that uh, ends in PHP. However, if we look at the lines of context around this, we'll see that the uh, line above it seems to do a, a check that post type exists in an array of permitted methods. And so if those permitted methods are all you know, static strings, chances are that you won't find a, a post type that will match the in array while still being user controlled. <clears throat> so what it looks like a local file include uh, in PHP, chances are you can't actually exploit this. But we see that there's a lot of uh, include uh, type of uh, vulnerabilities or vulnerability candidates where the, uh, the super global get or post are used. And again, there's a pattern here in, in the development um, above this line, it does a in array check. This one does a if file exists check. So that one you could potentially bypass. Uh, this one doesn't seem to do any checks, at least not that we can see. So that would probably be my, my first starting point, right? This is uh, another great thing with this one is because there's no data before the user controlled bit. It means that we could attempt to do streams. So you could do include uh, HTTP for to see whether or not, you know, a, a remote file include is possible or a FAR phar colon slash slash uh, ssh expect some of the other ways of uh, get code execution uh, through include files if you can't if you can't locally control the file ending in .php you might be able to affect the execution so that it reads a remote file uh, or it doesn't matter uh, so I would take this into my notes. I'd, again, it's most likely not necessarily trivially exploitable. It lives in an admin file. Chances are there's authentication required to exploit this, but this goes in my notes and probably uh, the first that I add to my notes and the first thing I would look at from my notes. And then as we go down, there's just more of the same. There's another if file exist, if file exist, uh, this would probably be my second one where it checks whether or not the file exists and else it does something else. Um, but they're both user controlled uh, parts, which means that regardless of the outcome of this one, you're, the attacker could control the file path. Uh, from memory, having ordered this previously, I don't believe any of these are actually uh, exploitable. But this is my approach uh, to doing it. Uh, if we look further down, um, these are potentially SQL uh, arguments of certain limit for a, a database query. Uh, they are being filtered to int, so I'll skip those. Again, possibly, uh, possibly database queries. I think this line is actually more interesting, but it's not It's not something that matches what we'd call a, a predefined rules, uh, but rather something that we I'd choose to come back to look at because it's double handling something in a escape. Uh, it's doing your other code and then escaping. Uh, so you could potentially uh, have some, has some weird your other code, Unicode characters that possibly breaks out of this escape input uh, function. So again, I'd add that to my note and I'd come back and I'd, I'd read uh, this file, top to bottom. And then there's some more casting to int and then another potential open file include. And again, I just, I would just copy these lines typically. I just put it in a note and then I'd 
once I've collected uh, a few vulnerability candidates, I then go back and start working my way through them. Um, then we have some parameterized database queries that uh, they're actually safe, but because of the way they're written, they still match the, the text patterns of regular expressions. Uh, more parameterized queries, they're all fine. Uh, again, potential local file include, potential local file include, just add all of those uh, to my notes. Here's another interesting one where we have a, a class that in, in two cases reference a super global. So one references the get parameter, the other one uh, references a cookie value. Now, the first one seems to just change, uh, well, they both seem to just change the local variable limit for this class. Uh, but a class name table seems to suggest that it might be related to database. If it's related to database, you might be able to do SQL injection with this. If it's merely related to, say, output of a HTML table, um, you could potentially do process scripting. So um, again, add it. And the thing that's uh, noteworthy about this, if, if you're not uh, necessarily that familiar with uh, code review, you would imagine that this function should take uh, an argument rather than using a super global because uh, super globals could be changed in unexpected ways in the uh, and the workflow, they're, they're, in the case of PHP, they're always uh, user controllable, at least the cookie and the get variable. Um, so it's just sort of an, an odd coding practice um, that yeah, it's worth looking into. Then some more um, potential local file includes, and that's it. So that's a flatline database. It focuses more on uh, shell or SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities that'll often get you remote code execution. Once I've done that, I tend to then look at a database called Fruit. Uh, and this one has, similarly to the uh, Flatline database, uh, looks for reasonably uh, high exploitability uh, vulnerabilities. However, this one covers more bug classes, um, some which are quite noisy. So if I run this again, we'll see that here's a bunch of uh, basically uh, cross-site scripting where we're printing out PHP uh, or using PHP to print value inside HTML. Uh, so the first one, we see that it's doing strip XSS. <laughs> Uh, however, this one here is, appears to be completely uncontrolled. Uh, that one is an if statement, so that's probably okay. They're probably also okay. This one doesn't appear to do nothing this way. Maybe hard to spot, but there's, there's a function named underline here. Um, and then again here, so that's a function that's probably worth looking at to see what it does. Um, I'm guessing it's some sort of HTML encoding escaping uh, function. So yeah, just lots of XSS. And then again, here we can see the edit post type, which was the first uh, output, I believe it was the first output when we ran flatline. So you can see that there's, there's been a lot more vulnerability candidates uh, included in the output from, from fruit. And we'll skip that, we'll cut that short. It just, it's more of the same, um, but sort of higher level noise. Once I'm done with that, uh, I tend to run the default database. And we'll see here, we, 
Could we get some other things in, in this case? Uh, this is a markdown, so that's uh, not a problem. Um, could be an SQL injection here. Um, you'd have to you'd have to edit the code and see. Um, this this one is safe. It's uh, parameterized. That's something that we didn't, I don't think we've seen that one before, uh, where it has an array. Because the earlier ones tend to look for super globals in PHP, whereas um, the default database tends to look for more things that are just variables. So we'll find more candidates. And because we've already looked, hopefully at this stage, you've already looked at a few of them, maybe investigated some of them, gotten a feel for the code, you'll have an easier time of determining whether or not something uh, is a vulnerability based on this. Uh, we'll see that there's, there's also more uh, false positives. For example, here, uh, it's a false positive for a, a SQL injection where it's reacting on the word like, uh, followed by a variable later on. We'll also see that some generic uh, library matching um, well actually that one that one might be exploitable again we probably need privileges to use it but um, it's worth it's worth looking at so again it goes on goes on the list uh, here's some stuff that deals with file uploads that's always handy to look at um, and an interesting part of uh, of handling file uploads is exiting. Depending on what has happened up until this point, uh, if you exit without necessarily cleaning up, there's a chance that this file uh, is left on disk. And so uh, an attacker might be able to control um, the file name at a fixed location which combined with all these other potential file includes that we've seen, uh, that's a good candidate for chaining one vulnerability, which is the file include with the file upload and potentially get code execution. Um, and again, we see more uh, false positive for SQL injection. Um, and it's these false positives that are the reason why I like to start with a, a narrower um, section of vulnerability by class is one of review, right? If, if I'd done this with um, PHP, uh, then we just get a lot of noise. So some of the issues that we see here are uh, <clears throat> false positive, where there's something that matches code in the markdown regular expression, potential eval rule that only affects older versions of PHP. Um, the PHP rule set also explicitly tracks all super globals, and that's one of the reasons why it contributes to noise. Um, but it also looks at a lot of other bug classes, such as file handling in the case of file open and file writes, etc. And using the PHP rule set will allow you to get uh, quite a deep understanding of, of what the code is. Um, but because it tracks many additional by classes and um, <clears throat> super globals, it also does tend to be uh, more noisy. As such, I would never recommend that you run PHP across like an entire code base. Uh, I tend to look at it um, or use it when I'm looking at individual files or individual subset uh, of the code. Um, so I won't go through all of the, the output from uh, the PHP rule set. Uh, it's a lot noisier, but hopefully by the time you get around to maybe looking at the PHP rule set, you've also looked at a large number of the uh, the files that are in the code base. You've looked at the, the controls that are frequently used. Uh, and you can use that to uh, ease your 
dismiss code that you don't need to uh, investigate further. And that concludes the rule set database uh, portion. We'll move on to the miscellaneous scripts, which are some of the things that don't come in the distro packages. Um, so if we look into the broad miscellaneous folder, there's a number of scripts there. I want to cover all of them. Um, you can go and have a look. Uh, some of the ones that are, are quite useful. Uh, Gruffle hog, if you want to look for secrets and you don't enjoy travel hog. Um, if you want to only scan a particular uh, file extension, such as .php, you can use only files. There's some tech analysis, which we will look at. Um, and one that I also enjoy quite a lot is Gitlog, particularly if I'm reviewing projects that aren't necessarily open source. And I usually use that to look for uh, known vulnerabilities that have been sonically patched. And we can have a look at how that works by entering into PHP IPAM and then invoking Gitlog. The way Gitlog works is it runs uh, Gitlog and looks at the commit history and it uses regular expressions um, to find keywords such as security or um, SQL injection. And then it shows the affected commit and the comment, and then we can choose to investigate this one. Uh, this appears to be a reflected XSS. This and it moved on to another one. This also appeared to be the SQL injection. And there appears to be SQL injection here. It's adding from first queries and it removed uh, a query that can catenate a super global. And we can just uh, keep looking at uh, the different commits that matches this. Um, so we'll skip out of that. Uh, but it's a good way to look at uh, a code base history so you can see um, some uh, examples of, of how they used to do this, you know, in the case of the SQL injection, you can see they had a ten tendency to use uh, variables concatenated into the query string, which tend to lead to SQL injection. So you could uh, use that to inform your uh, additional subset of, of queries. One of the other things um, that's I think important to know with Crawdit is that because it's regular expressions, it doesn't have uh, any contextual awareness of the code. It only investigates one line of code at the time, and it's it's one line of text. It's not one functional execution of, of code. Um, and I, this, I have a great example of this where um, the semantic understanding doesn't apply. Uh, and one of the ways that we can uh, do that. So typically that's handled with uh, the code review tools having uh, two sort of functionalities. One is a semantic understanding and the other one is uh, applying taint where you, you track a variable from its source where it enters the application uh, and checks if it ends up in a, in a sync, which is function that you care about. And we can actually do this uh, with Crawdit. So we're going to look at uh, a, an old plugin for a uh, PHP application called Cacti. Uh, the plugin is called Superlinks, and it has some known vulnerabilities. Um, and we can just start off by looking at, we know that this file is vulnerable, Superlinks, Superlinks, PHP. And we're going to run 
the miscellaneous group PHP tagged. Now that takes, attracts all assignments from a super global by using a broader rule set that tracks the super global assignment. And then uh, it feeds that back into Grodit again to track the actual variable name. Um, we can see here that um, it assigns the super global get ID into page ID, and then later on uses page ID in uh, an SQL query, suggesting that this SQL injection, if there was any if statements or any other filtering on, on page ID that we needed to bypass, because we're tracking the variable name page ID, uh, that would also show up here. So this is quite handy. Uh, it only does one level deep of tech analysis. So only the first assignment, it doesn't propagate the assignment into other uh, variables. Uh, we can't effectively do uh, tech propagation uh, using just text matching. <laughs> um, we can do one level deep, which is quite often enough. Uh, as we can see here, we find the SQL injection. Uh, but if we wanted to look at a, a more specific, again, we'd look at PHP uh, using, uh, we'd use the, the PHP database and only look at one file, which we can do now. And we'll see here, it tracks the super globals. It doesn't track the assignment and it doesn't find the SQL injection. Um, but it does find some potential file includes. If we were to look at the code uh, in more details, which is usually what we want to do once you have a, a vulnerability candidate, uh, we'll run it through highlights so you can see the code highlighted. Uh, we can see that um, the page ID gets assigned here, it's then used in SQL query. Now, if you had a proper code analysis, not just grep, uh, that would propagate the tape into the page variable. But we can manually do this by keeping it in our head. Um, you then propagate this into superlinks nab. But I think the more uh, interesting portion here is where my file gets propagated to a file path with the page content or page with the content file column of the page row returned from the database, which is vulnerable to SQL injection. So this file path is controllable through manipulating the output of the SQL injection. And then that file is used in an include statement. So you have second order local file include through the use of SQL injection. And in order to effectively track this, we would have to propagate tape multiple times. Um, but we can use Grodit uh, and the various script to get a pretty good indication that this file is worth looking at because that's SQL injection. And then when you do the actual manual review, and you apply uh, human thinking, then uh, you can find uh, additional vulnerabilities. This is particularly true when you're dealing with uh, code which may contain uh, logic flaws, and or it may lack uh, it may lack a control being present. So things like authentication bypass um, is difficult to find programmatically because it's the program can't make an informed decision as to whether or not a file should include uh, an authorization or authentication check, uh, but a human can. It's harder to programmatically detect the absence of something. And that concludes the demo. Um, I'll link to some videos uh, down in the comment that uh, deals with code review in more detail. Um, and of course, if you have any uh, suggestions, contributions, um, if you want to contribute to development of Grodit, uh, 
Um, the best way to do that is through the GitHub, open an issue, open a pull request, um, you know. Uh, and again, links in the comments, um, and I hope you all have a great day.